Good evening, and welcome to Paranormal Gateway Paratalk. My name is Scott Wise, and joining me as host tonight is Mel McIntosh. Our special guest tonight is Leslie Rule, an author for over three decades. Rule's other work includes two suspense novels and five non-fiction books on the paranormal, including Coast to Coast Ghost, one of my favorites, two only the across in America. And now she released a new book, Haunting in America, True Ghost Stories from the Best Collection of Living Rule. True accounts collected from her years of research in ghostly encounters in the United States, also including revised and updated content. Leslie Rule also had a true crime book, A Tangled Web, covered a frightening Omaha love triangle and murder, and became a lifetime movie called Disappearance of Carrie Farrer. With tonight's show, we're going to talk about ghosts and her new release and paranormal experiences she had over the years as a paranormal investigator. If anyone has paranormal questions or comments for Leslie or ourselves, please leave a message in the chat and we'll get to you as soon as we can. Without further ado, let's look for Lizzie show. Leslie! Thanks for having me. <laughs> oh, that, I was looking forward to it. I was, I was scared you took time out of your schedule. I know you're probably, you know, as soon as you're released, you probably got people calling you left and right through interviews. And things. Well, what's nice is people are interested in ghosts year round. And mm -hmm. when the first ghost books came out, the Coast to Coast Ghosts, that came out in 2001. Mm -hmm. And at that time, I was only interesting in October. And the rest <laughs> of the year, I was a nut. Mm -hmm. So, I had to focus all of my energy in October and with ghosts among us came out a couple of years after that. I did 70 radio interviews in the 10 days leading up to Halloween. Yeah. And I was exhausted and then everybody forgot about me. So now yeah. <laughs> it's changed and ghosts are a popular hobby. Yeah. It goes up like it's on and off and everything. Yeah. It depends what's going on, but yeah, your, your new book is awesome. I mean, and but your other books are too. I mean, I got like I want my shelf over there. <laughs> yeah. But Ghost of the Ghost of Among Us was one of my favorites too. And Ghost in the Mirror. Oh, thank you. I like it. Yeah. Yeah. So um what made you choose the topic of ghost? I know your mother was a true crime author and mm -hmm. um I know you helped her. Just some of her stuff and, and cases and stuff. But what made you decide to do ghosts and paranormal investigating? Well, I grew up in a haunted house in Des Moines, Washington, and I was fascinated. <laughs> I didn't think that ghosts were scary, but uh, I thought they were actually reassuring to think that we live on after our bodies die. So I wanted to prove to myself that ghosts exist. And that's why it was about 1998 when I started researching. And I wasn't sure what I was going to find. And I really wasn't looking to have experiences myself, although sometimes I did. What my plan was um, to visit haunted places, mostly public places, so readers could go there and photograph cool old buildings and talk to as many witnesses as possible who had seen apparitions and had other experiences in these places. And yeah, I when, think that the really validating thing was when I would find two witnesses who didn't know each other, for instance, in a haunted hotel, um, maybe they were both guests or maybe one was just happened to be a guest that um, contacted me and the other one would be an employee. And they would describe the identical thing. Mm -hmm. and that's validating when you have more yeah. than one person. Yeah, I think when uh, I started, it was back in 97, I think Ghost Hunting. And I saw your book. And then, um, I start, then I started following you because I, I thought it was a good book. So I start, stayed, as I started getting in contact with you, it might have been a little later. Right? I think it made it 2005. I think you always start to connect, I think. Probably around there, we, we actually met. Yeah. Yeah. The um, I think that the thing that 
I do a little bit differently is I delve into the archives. And I know um, most researchers do to some extent, but I'm obsessive about it. Yeah. So I wanted to find things in history, um, preferably forgotten things that people didn't really know about. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to find things that matched what was being seen. So I looked for um, mostly violent deaths because that tends to create the most ghosts, suicide, murder, accidents, although uh, haunted places might be a result of um, someone who died of a disease in a particular place and is attached to it. So I, when I started out, I had to fly across the country to whatever place I was researching. And now this was before people, I didn't know anybody that had a, had a laptop and I don't even know if email existed. It may have, but it wasn't common yeah. among people. Yeah. I didn't have email yet. No, I think it was like mid eighties to early eighties when we had a laptop. I might have been slow getting oh, it, God. but like in the 1990s, it wasn't, you know, like it is now where everybody has email, even your dog. You know, so <laughs> My dog left her, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I would have to go to the cities and the archives, like the news archives were usually stored in one of two places. If they had them, one was the library and the other was the newspaper office. And <laughs> Sometimes there was absolutely no organization. So there might be a century worth of newspapers just stacked on tables. That, that was the case in Whitefish, Montana. And it was a matter of just going through and trying to read as many stories as possible to find something that matched. And at the library, remember Microfish? Um, yeah, that's your bias for that. Yeah. Roll it. Yeah, <laughs> Slap find it. your Roll subject. It. Slap and, and we had to thread these um, reels of microfish into these machines uh, yeah. that half the time didn't work. And you'd have to have the librarian I've, I've come over that. and oh, fix yeah. it. And the light bulb would burn out. And if you found something you wanted to record, it probably took five minutes to just adjust it so you could take a picture of it. Right. I think it was 10 cents a copy. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So it was an arduous process. And yeah. it's been, my last ghost book came out in 2008. So I hadn't done, I researched other books like the, the right. um, true crime, but this it's been quite a while since I actually tried to find um, cases that match things being seen. And it's such a luxury to sit on the couch. I, I, um, I subscribe to a few uh, archive banks of newspapers mm -hmm. and I don't have to leave the house. I don't have to get out of my pajamas. I can just sit there with my cab. Yeah. And and like, like with this book here, it was easier, uh, better or easier to jump back into it. Cause you, you go through, I guess we hard pick which one each book, you know, for this, this new book. So how hard is that to do that? <laughs> well, it, you know, one of the things is that I had um, I have a number of updates in the in the new book in Haunted in America. Mm -hmm. So even though I've I've um, used stories drawn from the first four books because this is a best of collection, I now have, can find new things. There is so doing the updates was really exciting. Yeah, I love the updates. Yeah, and and. and other people who wouldn't even think about that, you know, what I mean, put it together and don't go as far as you did doing that. And I appreciate that. That's, that's good. Well, I, you know, I, I really enjoy research. I think that is probably my favorite part of writing. Mm -hmm. And it's like a treasure hunt, just going through newspapers and trying to find something that matches up. You know, like with the um, the Hotel Conneaut, there's a, um, a front desk clerk there. Uh, she's not doing that any longer. This was a long time ago. Carrie, Carrie Pavlik, who was interested in the ghosts there. And 
they reached out to me and said, can you come to the hotel? Is it Lake Pontiac, Pennsylvania? And all yeah, you, you, the you were too far away from me then. You couldn't stop and say hi. You know, I'm I didn't even know you yet. That, this was in 2002. Right, right. And like, you and I met, what, a decade ago? Yeah, yeah. So, Possibly yeah, so that was, that was if I had known, <laughs> I would have come. But oh, I um, so I went to the hotel and uh, I... I try to get my own stories. Um, and Carrie had written a, a, a little book, a self-published book, and she'd been um, collecting the stories that guests told her. But I, I looked for my own because I, and I used, you know, asked her, can I, I quoted her and I used some from her yeah. uh, experience. But I also walked all around the amusement park and talked to people trying to find new stories. And one of the things that's kind of interesting, and I heard this from, um, from her, was when she was working the front desk, and this was maybe 20 years ago, 15 years ago, she had several people walk up to her and they were, they were shocked and they were pale. And uh, she said, what's the matter? And they said, well, I just saw a little boy and he was crying. And he was most often seen in this room off the lobby where they had a TV. It was a little lounging room. And in one case, a woman was telling her about seeing this little boy. And at that moment, there happened to be another guest who didn't know that guest coming down the stairs. And she said, you saw him too? And he, he was, looked very real. He looked solid. And people didn't realize he was a ghost. And this one couple saw him standing behind a couch. And there was a lady sitting on the couch ignoring him. And they assumed the woman was his mother. And the little boy was just sobbing. And they thought, boy, that's oh. kind of cold-hearted of his mom just to ignore him. And then they thought, well, um, maybe, maybe it's not his mom. And, and she got up and left the room. And at that point, they knew for sure. But they still thought it was kind of odd that most of us, if we saw a child <laughs> crying, would offer a kind word. Right. And so the couple approached him and they said, what's wrong? And he said, I can't find my mommy. And so the couple had kids themselves and they, so they like children. And, and so the father held out his hand and said, come on, we'll help you find your mom. Wow. And Moment the little boy just vanished. Wow. For me, it will make you feel better. And I mean, if he had somebody actually acknowledge him. Yeah, to be acknowledged is, is a good thing. Yeah. yeah. So maybe he did just to have that sort of nurturing energy. And then one time my guest was in the, uh, the TV room and they saw a kid by the same description, pale, mm -hmm. dark hair, about five. And he was, um, he walked across the room and over the back of a chair and tried to crawl out the window. That wasn't a dangerous thing because it opened up to the balcony. It was on the first floor. But the guests thought that they should correct him because it really wasn't designed as a passageway. So they went to stop him and he was gone. Right. So I wanted to try to find out who he was. And so. Right. What I do is I look in the archives for a death of someone that occurred in or near the premises or someone who had a connection to a place and try to find something that matches. So I was looking for a boy of about that age. Right. And I, it, it took a long time, you know, probably maybe over a week of just going through old newspaper mm -hmm. archives because you have to put in just the right combination of words for an article. Right. Up. All right. And I may have found him. There was a little boy. His name was um, uh, Franklin Donald Gibbs, and he had just turned five. And he was um, at the the amusement park. At um, they had there is a place it was called the boat dock, I think, and it was about a couple hundred feet from the hotel. And it was like a. Um, be a little snack place or a, maybe a, a bar and there were, there were docks there. And, uh, 
Frank was playing with his sister and a group of other kids. And they weren't supposed to go near the water because parents had told them that. But they did. And Frank had just turned five. So he probably felt like he was mature enough and could handle himself. And they went, um, walked on the dock and they were playing on there. And then all of a sudden, his hat fell into the water. And he knelt to reach for it. Mm -hmm. and, he in, um, and he vanished beneath the surface. So the kids started screaming for help. Uh, two fire departments responded. It took 40 minutes, but um, they found him finally um, quite a ways. He floated quite a ways from uh -huh. the rock, and they got a grappling stick and pulled him out. And the, a doctor tried to revive him. They injected adrenaline into his heart. And is that something they do now? Do you know, Scott? I think they still do. If they okay. can't, I actually don't say this. <laughs> yeah. I've never heard of it before. Yeah, yeah. What about you, Mel? Um, that I, I don't know if they do yeah. that. Um, just yeah. like the I EMTs. I know it's something that they can do. In it was 1938, so I thought well, maybe they had different ways of doing things. Well, I, yeah, I they do, they do that, I was not going to do a it didn't but work. Uh, we talked about child spirits and stuff. Yeah. Um, many years ago, when we first started off, we had a residential case uh -huh. down in Maryland, and they had a lot of activity there. They were kids' voices and stuff. And there's also uh, a mean one there, too. That was, they, uh, they thought that they were keeping him that from going. Oh, so my he friend, was kind of rooted there. Yeah, and then what happened is we um, decided to do a smudging. All right, mm -hmm. and as we were doing the smudging, uh, I went back over. Uh, we saw here so back over, and I got a clear EVP saying, "I think I'm crossing over, mother." Oh, so that um, you recorded that? I think yeah. I'm crossing over, <laughs> mother. Oh, uh, yeah. I get goosebumps when I say it. I, I, yeah. I, I, I'll that's, say it to you. That was one of the best ones we ever had. And, uh, wow. That's, it's that's just, it just makes you melt all over. Yeah. You, know, you know, a lot of times they don't know. But if that spirit went over, um, and I guess the other one too, because they have, they have any problem with it. Now, we always tell them that it will try our best, and we don't usually do smudging and stuff, but they want somebody to do it. and. And Bill, Bill is up for, you know, and uh, we don't like evil stuff. We'll, we'll come to go get priests or clergy or something, but you know, we don't take part of that. Yeah. But, yeah. That's a, that's a really interesting. You've gotten quite a few interesting. I've got a lot of stuff for the years. So we, oh, yeah. I got a lot for you. Yeah. Yeah. You've sent some of them to me. Yeah. It's it's really interesting the um, voices recorded electronically. It's been going on a lot longer than well, any of us realized. Yeah. Before before call or ID, there weren't as many reports as there are now of spirits calling on the telephone, and oddly enough, this seems to happen frequently. <laughs> uh, it'll happen like right after. Somebody dies and their cell phone is, is tucked away in their purse or uh, in a dresser drawer and their loved ones will get a call from that number. And But there's nobody there. Very rarely has someone told me that they actually heard a voice in that case. The, um, the first case I ever heard of a possible um, telephone call by a ghost was in my childhood home. And it was about 1963. And my parents um, purchased the house from my grandparents. And they went there on the weekends to remodel and get the place ready for us to move in. And they, my mom wallpapered and tiled the floors and, and my dad took down, down walls and put up new ones and that kind of thing. And while they were working, they would hear the phone ring and it would ring persistently. So they'd walk to the wall where the old fashioned phone had once been mounted. There was a big rectangular indentation in the wall. 
back in the, it was probably 1930s, 1940s. It was common for the phones to be set back. There were those great big, uh, you know, those great big phones, square phones, yeah. rectangular. Mm -hmm. And the only thing left were wires sticking out of the wall. And it's not the wires that ring, it's the mechanism mm -hmm. inside the phone. Right. Mm -hmm. But the phone was long gone. And my my parents were fascinated. They weren't right. afraid, which is probably why I've, I've never been afraid of ghosts. Right. Because, you know, you, you kind of take on your parents' fears and their attitude about things. Yeah. And they concluded it was my great-grandfather, mm -hmm. my father's grandfather, Reverend William John Rule, who had once lived in the house. And he was a very, very kind man. And so when I was a child, they they said, you know, he, he's here. And I was comforted by that because I was, I got scared sometimes, but I wasn't scared of the idea of his ghost. I, I felt like it, it was that there was something else there. And I think there may have been, and it's possible he was protecting us. Well, yeah. It's kind of yeah. interesting because I, um, when I was maybe uh, seven, six, seven years old, and I had a problem, I thought, you know, and this is like a child's way of thinking. Well, my great grandfather was a minister, so I don't think I want to bother God because he's got all these people praying to him, praying to him. So, you know, my, I thought my great grandfather was kind of like an assistant. So I would send my paper <laughs> to him. And I outgrew it. I just thought, you know, as I got older, I thought, well, that was pretty silly. And I never <laughs> told anyone I did that. Right. And then one day I was at an event with two uh, psychic mediums, a married couple, Skip and Sharon in Federal Way, Washington. And they were up in front of a crowd of maybe 50 people uh, watching and they would pick up on things from the audience. And Skip looks at me and he says, I smell salt water over here. And the house was sitting on a hill that overlooked Puget Sound. On stormy days, the splatter would hit the windows. It was that close. And I went, I kind of nodded. I said, that you know, could be me. And when he started to tell me what had happened there, I was so astounded. I couldn't even respond to him. I was just, I was kind of shocked, actually, because he says there was a ghost in your house. And he said, he says, you know who this is, you know. And then he said, you used to whisper to him when you were a child. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, wow, I, what I thought yeah. after I grew up was just a, a child's crazy imagination may have actually been true. <laughs> now the house was built on a disturbed burial ground. Um, American, uh, Native Americans had been buried at least right next to the spot where my childhood home would one day be built. And my family had been, the rural side of the family had been in Des Moines for quite a while. And when my dad's dad, John Rule, was 10 years old in the year 1910, um, city workers were putting in a road that, that would lead to the beach. And it was right below my house. And as they were tearing up the ground, they pulled up a canoe. And it was apparently a sacred burial site because it was filled with skeletons. Um, they probably died from one of the diseases that, you know, the English brought here, you know, because they didn't have natural immunity. Um, they was filled with skele skeletons and also beads necklaces, bracelets, oh, wow. and the neighborhood boys, some of them, they raided the grave, which very disrespectful. Yeah. And one of the kids took a skull and stuck it on a oh, fence. God, post. he's going to hell. And the neighbors were really <laughs> upset about that. So there may have been some disturbed, unhappy spirits. I don't know. Maybe well, they the, the stir people, the stir people too. Yeah, well, those, the, yeah, the and the little boys, of course, were probably most of them grown, grown old. 
I think some of them could have still been living in Des Moines, actually. So maybe, wow. maybe um, they were being haunted because the whole neighborhood had activity. Mm. And I didn't, um, I didn't see anything there, but I had an experience where I heard something. And I was about 12 and I was lying on my bed, reading a book and all of a sudden, it sounded like it was right outside my room. The door was shut. Right. I heard this <clears throat> heart wrenching sob, and it sounded like somebody was really, really upset. Mm -hmm. And I immediately figured it was my sister and she was a couple years older. And I thought, oh, some boy has you know, broken her heart. And I jumped up out of <clears throat> bed and ran out to the hall to find out what was wrong and comfort mm -hmm. her. But when I got out there, now the crying seemed like it was in another part of the house. It sounded like it was coming from upstairs. And so I chased the crying all around the house. And I would say it may have gone on for as long as a minute, but it always seemed to be one room away. And then it just faded. And so my sister wasn't home. My brothers were in the backyard playing basketball. And my mom was in the kitchen, no tears. And I, no. I told her about what I heard. And it was, it was the, I have never in my life heard the sound of somebody crying to, to the point where you could just, you could almost hear their heart breaking. It mm -hmm. was absolute devastation. Mm -hmm. So it turns out that, um, there had been crying heard throughout the neighborhood. And my mom would say that wow. the neighbors would ask her. Cause sometimes when my mom and I would do book signings together and we would, we would talk before we signed books, like at a bookstore, we'd, we'd get up and tell some stories. And my mom said that she remembers the neighbors saying, who is it around here that cries all the time? And about a block up the street on sixth Avenue, there was a family who was renting a house um, and their name was Smith. It's not a pseudonym because in, in, in the book, I try to use as many real names as possible. It really was their name. Right. And um, there was the woman named Sandy Smith. Um, my mom was friendly with her and she came to our house one day and she said, I wonder if you can help me. I've got this odd thing going on. She said, every night as it starts to get dusk, we hear it starts out as a faint crying in the field behind the house. And as it gets later and darker, the cry gets louder. And finally, when it's pitch dark, it sounds like it's coming from their cellar. And it's accompanied by the sounds of bones crunching and jars yeah. rolling. And it wasn't like a kind of basement where you go hang out, you know, with a pool table and that kind of thing. It was just a little cellar. And they were renters and they'd never ventured in. And so Sandy asked my mom, will you come check it out with me? Because she was thinking that maybe some animal had gotten trapped in there. Mm -hmm. She's trying to look for that logical explanation. Because we tend to do that. We Most of us just don't immediately think ghost. We try right. to rule out yeah. you know, things that... Lo we look at the logical, which you know, cause in our culture, it's... It's a lot of people consider it nutty to believe in ghosts. Right. And so my mom went to Sandy's house and they prepared to go into the cellar. But at the last minute, they said, let's get the dog to go in with us. But the dog would not go in. He stood at the doorway and he would not budge. And the fur on the back of his neck went up. Mm. And so my mom and Sandy went in. All they found was a cleanly swept floor, um, no jars, no bones, nothing to explain the sound. Now, if, if I'm not getting too long-winded and this isn't getting too boring, I can tell you about the resolution, the um, possible identity of the ghost that was eventually discovered. Do you want me to tell Yeah, you? heck yeah. yeah that's um, really cool. <laughs> so... I have a friend, Nancy Meyer, who's uh, a very famous psychic, and she used to work for police solving crimes. She could look at she can look at a crime scene photo 
and find clues. She can she can see things as if she's watching the actual crime occur. And I met her when I wrote for Woman's World magazine back in the 1990s, early 1990s. And my assignment for my editors was to interview psychics who work with police and also to interview the detectives who work with them, who are vouch for them. So I did that with Nancy and um, she had a very good reputation and she would estimate 80 to 90% of the time she was able to bring something new to the investigation that they didn't otherwise have. So um, I had with Coast to Coast Ghosts, I had Nancy read some of the photos mm -hmm. and she was on the East Coast and I was on the West Coast. So we did this over the phone and I mailed her a packet of, of photos of various haunted places I'd been to. And she waited till we were on the phone and then she pulled them out and she would give me details of many that turned out to be right on. So I knew she had this ability and I had been invited to be on this afternoon show in Seattle called Bless North Coast Afternoon. It was a, a live show, really popular show. And I'd been on it a few times. But they um, they wanted to have me on for their Halloween show. And Yay. I suggested that we have Nancy on over the phone to read some photos. Mm -hmm. So they arranged it. And um, it was she was on the phone. You couldn't see her. Didn't have this technology then. Uh, so... She opened the envelope on the air, and there were photos of the site of my childhood home, where you know where the sobbing ghost was. Mm -hmm. And it, today, it's a park called Overlook Park. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> they tore the house down years ago. So the, Nancy looks at the photos and she says, "I hear crying." Aww. And then she said. It's a woman whose child was taken away from her. Mm. So the child didn't die, but it was taken away because people thought she was she was too young to take care of it, and she's looking for her child. So I thought, wow, that's interesting. But you know, I, I had nothing to validate that that had actually happened. And then it may have been like a year or two after that, my mom and I were a book signing that was put on by the Des Moines Historical Society, not Des Moines, Iowa, Des Moines, Washington. <laughs> and we were in their building and they had pictures all over the wall. And there was a house um, that was right next door to the house where the, they had the cellar that the uh, lady had. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. So this house was right next door and they both backed up to this big field. And uh, it was, I always thought it was a cool house. When I was a teenager, it was, they called it like a hippie haven because they're always like pot, you know, people in there that did pottery and the guys had long hair. Uh, so, but I never really thought about what it would be. It turns out it was an orphanage and it was Daddy Draper's home for children. And they had a band. Um, he had all the kids play instruments and they would travel wow. all over the country and they came <clears> to <throat> perform. So it's sort of like the light bulb went on over my head. Well, his house backs up to the field where the crimes heard. Nancy Meyer, the, um, the very accurate psychic, says that a crying woman is looking for her child who was taken away. Maybe a third. Child. Oh, but it could it's be a draper. Yeah, my dad <laughs> uh -huh. a draper. Now I I can't <clears throat> say that that's what right. happened. Right. I mean, this. this is... and, you know, and I try to. I I never say this is the way it is, and and even right. when it comes to, I, I believe there are ghosts, but and I've seen patterns in things occurring, but I never ever say I know that something is right. When I can't say for sure, but Ms. Scott, you probably noticed that there's quite a few so-called paranormal experts that will, they make stuff up. And oh, then they yeah. think coming right. out of their mouth, it's the truth. Right. Like right. like the guy that said, I was I, a, I don't, I don't, I don't know if it is the paranormal expert. I think 
you know, nobody knows everything about it. And and it's gonna be over the next few years, I hope and think it's gonna be more things coming out that's gonna help. Because more and more each year, the more it could be coming out that seems to help and Yeah. But um I just stick my recorder. I have fun with that. So. Yeah, yeah. The yeah, whole thing is really fascinating, but uh, none of us can say for certain. Uh, so I was at a paranormal uh, conference yeah. once. Well, until, and, you're de- until you're dead, then you'll know. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Then we'll know once we're on the other side. Yeah. So there was, I won't even say who it was and when it was or where it was, but he was a so called paranormal expert. And he tells the group, killers never remain as ghosts. Stated it as fact. Hmm. And I happen to have quite a few cases that the suspected ghost is the killer. Yeah. For instance, Eileen Wernos supposedly haunts the bar where she was arrested, the last resort. Hmm. You've got yeah. a lot of activity there. Are you familiar um, with that one, either of you? I I, was just, I read in your book. Yeah, I, yeah. I just read that today. Flash is one. Yeah, yeah. Well, so Eileen Wernos, of course, was the female serial killer, um, and she would date men and um, she, pick, pick them up. Bang. And I think <laughs> it was sort of like a prostitution type relationship. But then she would kill the men. Bang. She rob them. Yeah, and shoot him dead. <laughs> yeah. So, um, the the owner Al told me that sometimes there'll be a day it's really quiet, the wind's not blowing, mm-hmm. but the back door will suddenly just fly open, mm-hmm. and then suddenly the TV channel will turn. Nobody's <laughs> hand is on the remote, mm-hmm. and then. And he'll say, who pissed you off this time, Eileen? And then the front door will open as if she's taking the path that she took in life. Because he used to let her stay in a trailer out mm-hmm. behind them. Yeah. So the, the story is that, he, that there she had a favorite pawn shop that she would go to that was near there. So that's why she liked that bar. So after mm-hmm. she robbed the men, she would sell her stuff at the pawn shop. And well, then the jukebox go off to by itself. I there there there's a few places where the jukebox went off, but I, yeah. I do think I heard that about. Yeah. Um, sometimes I get my my stories mixed up, but that yeah. sounds really familiar. I'll if you, if you read it in my book, that yeah. means that I heard it from somebody. Yeah. <laughs> that, that happened. <laughs> but that was interesting when they mess with the electronic equipment. Oh yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. And they do that a lot. Mm-hmm. So, Mel, have you seen a ghost? No, I haven't seen anything. Um, that's actually part of why I joined Scott's group is to uh, increase my chances of mm-hmm. seeing oh, something. Oh, you will. I know. Yeah. <laughs> right now. Um, yeah, but you spent the night at Post Town, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, all weekend. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So. Okay, right, we can go back. I love it. Okay. I love yeah, I got to go there in person with you. That sounds really cool. Yeah. Well, so and the, and the owners seem really nice. I, I so. you could do something for um, Mary Spring sometime next year when it's kind of nice. Yeah, you know, that'd May, be great. Uh, maybe around March or something, because that's just when it starts getting well, cooler. I'm actually going to be um, giving some talks in May, kind of in that direction. So maybe we'll work something out around there. I want to oh, be right. sure that the last snow is over. Right. You know, I want to get stuck at an airport. All right. If it comes down to it and it's last minute, it might be like at the fire museum. The fire um, museum. Yeah, that was a really interesting one. Yeah. We're trying to um, have it out to him. I should, you should have to tell me that we're going to have it um, in the fun for next month, the 12th. So yeah. we're going to get it three weeks. So. I gotta go there Hopefully. with you. Yeah. Yeah. This this will be our fourth time. <laughs> You've been there four times. It'll be four times. Yeah. Yeah. I, and you got some EVP there, didn't you? For me. It's right down the road for me about an hour, so it's not that far from me. It's like. Do you have what? EVP from the fire museum oh, handy yeah. that you could play right now? Um, I don't know who or not. 
If you don't have it, that's okay. I just I, thought I, you had I, it handy. I probably don't. I got you send you some. Uh, yeah, I, I always thought that the viewers might like to hear because I've heard some of the stuff you sent me, and I thought it was really interesting. Now, yeah. earlier when you showed um, the basketball um, court at Post Town, were mm -hmm. we live? Like, were people already listening? Yeah. They, yeah. Okay, so they've heard that. All right. Yeah, um, I have a uh, one here from um, up in New York. I think I have one. Uh, Mary New York, you tell you about um, the, uh, the museum in New York, Palmyra. That's all I've told you about. That'll be a really good one to your next book. About, about that, the people who died in the fire, the family. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. The, mm -hmm. the, the, the thing are the regions, Brother it, Ray. And that's the one you and I were emailing back and forth, and I did some newspaper research on it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and and it I was think, it Christmas I think, time. Yeah, I think it's most, And they just moved there. Yeah. Or I about to move. I think it's Mr. T. Well, here's the EP you got. Um, yeah. Uh, do we hear it? Yeah, let's hear it. <laughs> you have a handy? Yeah. Hey, come on out. These guys are from, came all the way from Pennsylvania to come and see you. Did that light just go out on that computer? Is there, is there a reason that did that? Come on, Hey, come on out. These guys are from, came all the way from Pennsylvania to come and see you. Did that light just go out on that computer? Is there, is there a reason that did that? Come on down with us. That's come on down with us. Yeah, you, that, you played that for me before. Yeah. And it was I, interesting thing gives me the chills because it's if I remember correctly, the whole house collapsed into the basement and yeah. mm -hmm. and so they were all died down there or they're probably yeah. dead before that happened. Yeah. It was like and, a and then the father came home. Yeah. He I think he had a um had gotten a truck or had a trailer that he was pulling. And mm -hmm. uh, if I remember right, they were supposed to move that day. Am I remembering yeah. that right? Yeah. 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 And so he came pulling up to the house and can't imagine all of his children and his wife and she was very young she had a yeah. whole bunch of kids and i think scott and i figured out that she must have started like at age 15. is that what um, we thought yeah yeah for really or six years yeah. Yeah, yeah so young yeah but, sure, but it, i think she had five shins though um, i'll have to look at the articles again but but i remember it was really interesting and that was one I was thinking I should put in a book. And so you could maybe take me there when and now new is that New York? New York, yeah. Yeah. We go there. Yeah. yeah. That'll take one too. Well, that we, sounds we, good. We want to get back there. Yeah. But the other real thing is that the two of the children's names are Sharon and Susan. And my wife's name is Sharon and she has a sister named Susan. Ah. Oh. <laughs> really? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, well, that was a that was a really uh, what they say class A EVP. Yeah, it was, that was pretty good. Cool. When I found that, I'm like, I couldn't believe what I was hearing. So, I, so I sent it to everybody else that without saying what I thought I heard. Yeah. And when Bill got it, Don got it. Like, oh my God! And they were like freaking out because that's one of the best EVPs they ever got. I yeah. Know. What do you think is another um, like up there with that one that you got? Well, um, well, one of the when I first start, a very first investigation was at a church. A church in, in, in Flower Town, uh, PA. Which town? Flower Town. Uh huh. Yes, yeah, F L O U R town. Yeah. Um, we had church, and um, we were in the playroom, and we were sitting at the table, and there's me and my, um. The, uh, the leader of the group who owned it and his wife, me and her were sitting in the playroom of the church. Uh, we're all just going when they're having services and we were doing like knock on the table and stuff. And I have, I wish I pulled up. I don't know if I have right now. I, I, I can get it. Um, I knocked on the table like a couple of times. And she says, can you make that noise that he did? And it comes back and says, I can't. 
<laughs> the kid's voice. It was a child's voice that said, I can't. I can't, yeah. I, I can't imitate you. I can't, uh, was it still a church or had it turned into something else? Actually, um, last, I think it's been shut now for, um, oh, God, for like five years now. Because it's been shut it, down? Yeah, it was built back in 1860-something, I think. It was church. It was really old. Do you know, did you find out what happened there, by chance? Uh, why it closed down? Well, why, what could have caused the paranormal oh, activity? Oh, yeah, there... yeah. That means that, um, actually, they, uh, think they had a little boy spirit named Freddy. But do they know how he died? Um, they think uh, he had some kind of disease. Um, I can't and he died at the church? Um, not that he died at the church, but they buried him there. Oh, well, I'll, that'll be one that we can talk about later, too. I'll, I'll do some archival research and see what I can do. Yeah, it's our town, um, PA, and this. Um, yeah, the, uh, I, when church. I do churches, I don't like to do the ones that are still active <clears> because that could be upsetting to some people think that they just are really uncomfortable with the idea of ghosts and right. their religion doesn't embrace it. But this one's not a church anymore, right? It's, it's, it's a church standing there, but they don't have services. They don't have. There. No. Yeah. Because the, the big cemetery they have is there. Yeah, yeah. Like, well, that's huge. That's a big ass cemetery, too. Yeah. yeah. And huh. actually, with that cemetery, were um, a family who's. Um, what died at the line for the Titanic is there too. So. Oh, from the Titanic. And one of the boys that were there, that was the family, um, his birthday is the same day as mine, August 20th, 1968. That's your birthday? Yeah. I, my uh, birthday. You were born in August 1968? 20th. Yeah, I was born in 1968. August 1968. His, yeah, uh, but his birthday is August 20th. Yeah. So, yeah. And so he yeah. wasn't on the Titanic, obviously. There, no, where, no, where did he come no, from? He was Is the he family. the ghost boy? No, that's Freddy. Um, he was the part of the family who was there. Um, they have a big tombstone of them, and it's really nice. I'll, I'll, a picture of tombstone I'll get to you. But <sighs> more than any of that family. <sighs> um, what were their names? Have that's you been to that one, one Mel? No, not, not yet. yet. Um, I've I've uh, only actually been to two locations so far. I've what was the, the other one besides Post Town? Uh, the Fire Museum in Mansfield. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. What did you think of it? I really liked the Fire Museum. Um, I really want to go back. I thought yeah. it would be really cool. Um, well, maybe we'll all go together when I come to town. Yeah, yeah. that would be fun. That would be nice time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Now I sent, or I had the publishers. No, I sent you the audio tape. My I found it after my publisher would have done it, but um, but I sent you the audio tape because you had mm -hmm. a headache that day. Um, did you get a chance to listen to much of it? Yeah, I'm. I think I'm up to almost up to school spirit. Yeah. Have, yeah. Is that yeah. did it? Did you get past the Queen Mary? I can't. Oh well, yeah, that. yeah, Queen Mary. I read that one. Yeah. Wasn't that bizarre? Yeah, yeah, it was. So I should have want me to tell your listeners yeah, yeah, and viewers. Yeah, yeah, that's a good one. Yep, yep. So the SS Queen Mary, of course, is a very, very famous haunted ship in Long Beach, California. And it's been covered extensively. And I wanted to find something new because the stories were told over and over again. So I wanted to find um, something historical that people weren't aware of that might explain some of the sightings. Now, I was inspired to, to look for a particular case because of an old Unsolved Mystery episode that I watched on YouTube. And there was, um, yeah, I think it was in the 1980s, and there was a woman, she was on camera, and she told the story there. And her name was uh, Carol Layden, and she was a waitress there. And she said that one morning, very early in the morning, when it was quiet, she 
saw somebody sitting at a table and she didn't hadn't seen heard them come in and she went over with coffee and she took a look at the woman and she noted that she wore an old fashioned dress maybe from the 30s or 40s and her hair was in those braids that they coil up on the side of the head like they used to do in the 1930s and she poured coffee and then she walked away and she turned around for another look and the woman was gone and wow. i thought i thought i don't know why i'm maybe just a tiny 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 bit intuitive psychic because i kind of had a feeling that a woman had disappeared from the ship so i searched missing and women missing from ship and I, it took me about three days, but I kept digging and digging because I just felt like there, I could find something to validate what Carol had seen. And finally, I found it. And it was in 1936, a young woman by the name of Jane Carey, who all the pictures I've seen of her are the most um, popular one that they circulate is the braids coiled up on the side of the head. And uh, she's a very pretty lady. And she lived in Lynn, Massachusetts, and she was coming home from a year studying in Italy because she loved the Italian language. And she mysteriously vanished from the Queen Mary early one morning. Her roommate saw her, cabin mate saw her, and then and, um, and the cabin mate left the room for a few minutes. And when she came back, Jane wasn't there. And she waited about an hour when she didn't show up, she alerted somebody and they shipped the, they searched the entire ship. Now, um, the, I think the authorities wanted people, <clears throat> the authorities on the ship wanted people to believe that Jane had committed suicide and early <clears throat> report said heiress leaps from grand ship. Now, nobody saw that uh -huh. happen. There was no indication. There was no note. And I discovered that um, during this era, there, oh, there's a lot of cases of demon <clears throat> from these ships. And some of them were suicides. I doubt very many were accidents. But I suspect there was a serial killer that either worked or traveled on the ships, probably moving from ship to ship. And in each case, the the um, the ship management would shrug it off as, oh, well, it was a suicide. But in many of the cases, the woman had everything to live for, no indication of depression. So I think it's possible that someone deliberately hurt Jane. Uh. She lived in Lynn, Massachusetts. Um, her family was wealthy. She's never been seen again. She, was, she went to Smith College, and she was the third Smith College student to disappear in recent history. Hmm. Well, I want to say her, uh, her valuables are gone. She had one piece of luggage on that ship. The rest of her luggage was on a different ship that she had originally planned to travel on. Oh. And I found the... Um, the log for, I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing this right, but it looks like it's pronounced Staten Dam. I don't know, Staten Dam. I, I think it's Staten Dam. Um, that was a ship that was not as fast. And the Queen Mary, that was that was built by the people who had um, built the, the Titanic. And it was about 10% bigger. And it was great, greatly luxurious. And it was faster and... Jane wired her mother and she said, um, I'm going to be arriving in New York on this day. And then she got on, she almost immediately switched ships to the Queen Mary. And with her was a young man about her age. And he had also been studying abroad. And he lived about a mile away from her in Lynn, Massachusetts. And I found an article in in a uh, in a British newspaper about how uh, this this um, couple, Jane and her friend, had missed the Queen Mary, 
and they had to uh, have a little boat take them out so they could get on. And <laughs> nobody in America would have seen that article. I, I'm probably the first one that went looking for it because, of course, the archives are suddenly available. But you know, that was a little bit weird because <clears throat> he later claimed that he hadn't seen her before they'd gotten on the ship and that they were just friends. But a steward had said they were dancing together the night before. Uh, There's nothing to indicate that he harmed her. Right. Um, but I'm sure people will want to examine all sides, and there will be some people that will say he did. But in and I, I saw, found absolutely nothing to suggest he had anything but a high character. I, I researched his life. All right. Um, and so I am leaning toward somebody, a stranger, doing something to her. Because back then it would have been so easy. There were no security. All right. All right. And, and then they can, you know, get rid of the evidence. Just throw it over the side right. of the ship. It's in the middle of the ocean. It was a foggy morning. You know, no one would have seen anything. All right. And I really don't think that she jumped. Right. So it, it's very sad. It's like her, her mother um, absolutely broke down. Her mother actually was meeting the ship, not realizing that Jane was supposed to be on it because she had some friends she was picking up who she knew were on the Queen Mary. And she was alerted soon after that, that Jane had been on the ship and vanished. And Jane's luggage was with her friend um, still on the Staten Down. Oh, okay. And, but except for one piece of luggage. So it's a mystery. It's an unsolved mystery. But I suspect that is the ghost that, Carol Layden saw. So I thought, oh, I would love to get Carol's take on this. So I looked her up and she died about a ago. And she was only 72. I would have mm. loved to have shown her the photos and she probably remembered exactly what yeah. she saw because it was so intense. Yeah, I looked up there and I saw she passed away. So, so I thought yeah. she'd be, be have yeah. a good first time on Cheryl and I saw she she passed away. Yeah. Yeah. I think the Queen Mary I, uh, is one of the more fascinating places because uh -huh. it's different. I would love know? to go there. That's the whole year across the hill. Yeah. <laughs> That's kind of, I'll come visit you, I guess, to go see it. <laughs> yeah. Do we have time uh, left? We, Close, we, huh? we can go as long as you want. That's up to you. I mean, if you want to go where uh, I actually I have to, um, to be some someplace in about 20 minutes, so we should. Oh, yes, no finish problem, up but, at the normal but, time. Well, but, well, well, definitely have you back again. I mean, we got so much more stuff we can talk about. That's, that's for sure. Yeah, um, it's, it's good to be here. It's good to meet you, Mel. Yeah, it was good to meet you too. Hey, where please. are you guys going for your next investigation? The fire museum. Oh, okay. That'll be the fourth time hey, for uh, you, Scott. The yeah, second time for you, Mel. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Mel, Mel told me I should sign this and send it back to you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, oh, God. It was so much fun having you. And like I said, you'll definitely be back. Um, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm, we're booked out up through December. Uh-huh. So uh, probably sometime in New Year, back. but we talk a lot. Anyway, yeah, we do. We we, we talk on we private yeah. message through Facebook. Uh, and, yeah, all the time. Uh, it's just up to date on the. Yeah, also keep me up at night too. Apparently. Yeah, I'm up all night. I'm a night owl. Well, he, he messaged me at your three o'clock in the morning. I'm like, what are you still doing up? <laughs> yeah, I'm kind of an alien. I don't really adhere to normal <laughs> clocks. All righty. Um, go ahead and drop it up. And, and is um, this also recorded or only live? No, it's recorded. Uh, I, I'll give you an MP3 file. You know, it'll be on Spotify and cool. it'll be on um, other platforms too. Cool. I give you a okay. list. Yeah, it'll be on GS2. So, all righty. Well, um, everyone have a good night and happy haunting everyone. Happy hunting, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.